Um, hello everyone, so I think that we'll start now and um, one of the speakers should be arriving soon, so um, we'll just start now and then um, take it from there. So thank you everyone for coming, um, those in person and online. I can see that there's quite a few of you online. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever you are. Um, so my name is Yasmin Afina. I'm officially appointed as AI researcher at the UN Institute for Disarmament Research. Um, where I conduct research at the intersection between AI, international security policy, and international law. And I was until recently research fellow for the Digital Society Initiative at Chatham House. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, the session today will have three parts. So first of all, we'll, have, we'll hear quick presentations by the brilliant panelists we have here today, um, both in person and online. And then we'll have a quick set of reflections before we then eventually move to a moderated discussion between the panelists and the audiences joining us today. Um, please take the opportunity to engage. This session is not just about presentations and a QA. and a um, The IGF is a unique opportunity where we have such a diverse group of stakeholders all together, both in Kyoto and in the cyberspace. So we want to hear from your perspective too. Um, and before we start, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, I will be moderating the discussions throughout the session. My colleague Ron here will be helping me monitoring the online discussions as well. So if you're joining us online, please submit your questions in the chat. Um, or if you're joining us in person, please raise your hand. And the room is quite big, so don't hesitate to move forward. Um, or raise your hand really high, even do a little dance so that I can see you just so, yeah. <laughs> the se second, this session is recorded, live streamed, and will be available on YouTube. So despite being held by Chatham House, it's not under the Chatham House rule. And third, you will see flyers and little notes scattered across the room. So it's either the link to our polis, um, which Rowan will talk about a bit more in a minute, but using your smartphones, your laptop, wherever device um, you're using, please go to this link and submit your vote. For those joining us online, we'll pop the link of the polis in a minute. And for those in the room, you'll also see QR codes on flyers where you can see some of Chatham House's most recent projects, papers, and commentaries in the AI space. So without further ado, um, here next to me is Rowan Wilkinson. She's Program Assistant for the International Law Program and the Digital Society Initiative at Chatham House. Rowan is the primary engine behind Chatham House's work on international law and tech policy. So including our work on AI, which we'll hear more about from Rowan herself. So now over to you. Thank you. Um, so hello, thanks for joining our session. Um, my name is Rowan Wilkinson um, and I, know I work for the Digital Society Initiative and International Law Programme at Chatham House. Um, so just briefly, for those of you that are unfamiliar with our work, uh, Chatham House is not just a rule. Um, we are an independent-based think tank in London working in international affairs um, and we work in many thematic areas within this field, um, but my team, the Digital Society Initiative, focuses on research and policy for the better provision and governance of technology. And to this end, we explore four key areas, uh, big tech platforms, digital public infrastructure, international digital cooperation, and artificial intelligence, which is why you're all here today. Um, but this event is not a standalone piece, it's uh, part of a broader stream of work that we have on, um, on uh, responsible AI in practice. And this project really aims to um, support a lively and inclusive public debate on what responsible AI is, its risks and benefits uh, um, for our common information space, and also provide a multi-stakeholder platform to inform AI development. It also hopes to um, build mutual understanding between AI developers and public stakeholders and surface core concerns, questions, and assumptions that we hold around AI. So we began this project in the spring of this year um, with the support of Google um, by establishing our Responsible AI Task Force, um, which is a diverse group of experts from across the globe, Argentina, Kenya, the US, Indonesia, Iran, I could go on. Um, and what we're doing is we're hoping that beyond the normal aims of a task force to inform and guide a project, um, we're also looking to them to challenge our perceptions and bias as a UK-based think tank. Um, and we're lucky enough to have three of those members today, um, Millie, Kathleen, who's online, and also Hilary. Um, and then a second st strand of this project was also a Proust questionnaire, which you have links to on the tables in front of you, and I will share a link in the, ch in the chat later on. 
um, which hopefully gives you a moment of pause and deep reflection in what is often a very busy space of AI um, to really answer and reflect on some what we hope are very interesting and creative questions, such as, if I were worried about AI, would you reassure me about the future? How does um, AI affect the social construct? contract? rather? Um, and does AI need democracy, or does democracy need AI? Um, so if you're interested in this project, um, we also have an essay collection to be published towards the end of this year, which showcases different perspectives on AI and covers topics like CERN for AI, public interest in AI, revolutionary potential, AI and the COVID response, public interest, oh, um, and lots, lots more. Um, and yes, as Yasmin has said, there's some further work that we have on AI on your desk, including data data equity and governance, and also using digital democratic tools um, and processes to bridge um, the recursive, recursive public. Um, so yeah, if any of this interests you, please come up to me and say hello at the end of this session um, and check out the QR codes. Um, so as Yasmin has already said, we're gonna be using Polis um, to kind of gauge the audience's opinion and see consensus items in this debate today. Um, so we urge you to have a look at that. And for those that don't know, Polis is an intuitive consensus building tool where you're able to um, agree or disagree to certain statements that are posed by other participants. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to raise some of those as they come in throughout the session. Thank you, Rowan. Um, so uh, for those joining online, I've shared with you the link towards the policy. So how it works is that you, there are some statements, as Rowan mentioned, you just need to vote whether you is agree or disagree with the statements. Um, you can also submit the statements that you think are relevant when, um, in the context of our discussion. So please do submit your votes. We're really eager to, le to learn more about what you think about this question. So without further ado, in, we'll go, we're, we're going to the, to the presentation. So. We'll hear short presentations by our panelists joining us today. This workshop is about hearing perspectives on how communities and collectives can frame and guide the responsible development and use of AI technologies. So beyond the usual traditional state-centric models of governance on AI, which in a way are important, of course, but they may perhaps not be enough in certain contexts. And so without further ado, let's move to our first speaker. Um, we'll, so Millie here on, on the left. So Dr. Millie Zimeta is a freelance tech policy consultant based in the UK and also senior visiting fellow at the College of Graduate Studies at the University of South Africa. She was formerly head of policy at the Open Data Institute and has led digital tech programs at the Royal Society, UK's National Academy of the Sciences and the Alan Turing Institute, the UK's National Research Institute for AI. So without further ado, Millie, over to you. Um, thank you, Yasmin, and thank you for that fantastic introduction. And thank you all very much for being here today. It's great to see you, um, and really looking forward to hearing your perspectives and experience in the Q&A and discussion section of the workshop. Um, so my, my background is really data policy, um, and what got me interested in data was AI. Um, I realized that there are many ways in which the, the, the availability of data is what has made or created the conditions for the kind of um, developments in AI that we're seeing today, it's quite foundational. So the data that you have access to, the quantity of it, the quality of it, and, and the content of it, the nature of it, is really foundational in the kind of AI systems that you can then develop. And what that means is the governance that we put around that data, data governance, is also going to be quite foundational to the kinds of AI systems that we can, we can develop and that we can um, implement. So I see data governance as foundational to responsible AI. And what's been really interesting in the field of data governance is we're seeing community-led approaches um, as establishing a new kind of paradigm. And that's what I'm going to be looking at today. So before we get to data governance, oh, I, th I think we can, sorry. Um, so before we get to data governance, I think we're probably maybe more of us more familiar with data protection, in particular um, the e European Union's um, General Data Protection Regulation, D GDPR. So GDPR was the first major international attempt to write a data law, um, and it was massively influential from having that first mover advantage of being the first. Um, so GDPR has as its starting points um, the notion of um, individual rights, 
the notion of um, consumer rights and the protection of privacy. So GDPR, which has really influenced data protection around the world, is founded in individual rights, consumer rights, and protection of privacy. And it was really brilliant for what it established. Um, but we're starting to encounter the limitations of it in the field of AI. And that's where the opportunity for imagining something else comes in. So let's start with privacy. Um, although AI, in particular large language models, is getting a lot of headlines at the moment, something that we're seeing in stealth mode that's likely to take off in the next few years is privacy-enhancing technologies, also sometimes known as PETS, P-E-T-S. And what a privacy-enhancing technology allows you to do is analyze data while maintaining the anonymity of that data. And what that means is you can use a pet, you can use pets um, to work with data while potentially being compliant with GDPR, but still working with quite sensitive, quite personal data. And this creates a really interesting dilemma because you could potentially be compliant with GDPR, but doing something maybe quite unethical, you know? <laughs> and that's not covered because everyone assumed that, well, you know, if you, if, as long as you're aligned with GDPR, it's, you know, it's covered because of protecting individual privacy. Well, now we've got a category of technology where actually that might be bypassed. So it's really brought home that privacy is not sufficient. Um, and in the context of AI, what that tells us is that privacy, again, can't be sufficient for thinking about um, the governance of AI. Um, and we might need to think about a different kind of benefits, different kinds of risks, and different kinds of harms. So on individual rights and consumer rights, I'll take individual rights first. So think about genomic data. That's data about your genome, your genetic um, code. Your genetic data, your data about your, your genetic makeup is also data about your biological family. So even if you give consent for your genetic data to be collected and to be analyzed, that collection and analysis is going to have relevance and give insights about your biological family, and they may not have given their consent. And this really shows that individual rights, individual consent, individual decision-making may not be sufficient for how we think about data and how it's used, how we think about the consequences of data collection and data analysis. Individual rights are not sufficient. We need to think about the group, the community, and the collective. And again, in the context of AI, what that tells us is that harms can also be collective. So you sharing, say, personal data about yourself with consent, with permission, may harm other people who have a similar kind of data profile as you. So we need to think differently about harms and about rights. But on the consumer rights side, we also need to think differently about benefits. So a lot of the value and the power of data comes from aggregating it and treating it as a public good. So think about, um, you know, when Rowan was mentioning the role of AI in COVID response, a lot of what made um, public health responses workable was aggregating data, collecting data from around the world or within a country from different parts of the country in order to be able to act quickly. So in those cases, the, the benefit of data comes from the aggregation and the collection and the collective benefits. In those cases, individual rights may not be the only calculation. Um, and we see that in the field of AI as well. So part of the, the power of analysis comes from comparing data points. So one, one piece of data by itself is not as valuable as having multiple pieces of data and being able to map, map across them. And that has implications for how we think about the value of data, how we think about data markets, how we think about buying and selling and reusing data. So again, we need to think about collective benefits, what's good for the collective, what's good for the group, what's good for the community. So what we've seen is this kind of this approach to individual rights, individual um, consumer rights and privacy is not sufficient for the future of data governance. And we're seeing a need for collective rights, collective harms and collective benefits. European GDPR in its current shape doesn't seem able to navigate that. But this could be an opportunity for regions and blocks that are now drafting their data protection frameworks, that are drafting their data regulation, to think about taking it further than GDPR, taking it a different direction, um, and to factor in that, that nature of collective benefits, rights, and harms. 
Um, and I would also just mention that there are um, really good reasons to think that the majority world might be particularly well placed to take advantage of this, um, given those cultures tend to also be more collectivist by nature, and so um, the legislation would also be reflecting how decision-making works in those communities already. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Millie. Um, I think that that was a really fascinating introduction to the issue of, of, of you know, like community-centered um, governance of AI and the importance of it because of the collective harms, but also the collective benefits of it. And one of those collective benefits and risks are related to targeted communities like the youth. And without further ado, now I'm transitioning to Hilary, who will be talking to us more about the youth perspective. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Yasmin. Sorry, uh, I just uh, forgot to introduce you. Like, um, Hilary is an associate program officer at the UN Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. Um, and she leads the office's work on sustainable development, in particular on innovation and climate action. So she's really great, and I just you know, presume that everyone <laughs> would know her. So here you go, Hilary. Thanks, Yasmin, and uh, thanks for having me here. I really like actually how you frame this workshop, uh, that it's not only about sharing, but also about learning. And I think just from hearing from Millie earlier, uh, I've learned so much, <laughs> and I'm really hoping to learn more from the people in the room as well. But maybe perhaps let me start with sharing some insights on what we found while working closely with young people. Um, as you know, young people of today is not only one of the largest populations, they're also the most connected generation. And of course, the generation that is most likely to carry or feel the impact of the decisions, the decisions that we take today or the decisions that we do not take, right? And decisions on policies that significantly affects their lives, uh, including policies on AI uh, specifically. So earlier this year, our office together with partners from the UN like UNICEF um, asked young people from around the world uh, on their take on the digital future uh, we launched a global poll that reached nearly 80,000 uh, young people from across the globe, and we asked them what they think because we really want to hear it directly from them. And what we found is that 41% um, 40 of young people said that they're mostly worried about how technology will change the world over the next decade. And the top three concerns that they have voiced out, the first one is access um, to internet, and I think we hear that a lot here in the IGF. But the second one and the third one, I think is very much aligned also to what Millie has brought up, is actually um, they are very much concerned on the control of data and information and also the protection of human rights in this um, online, protection of human rights online in this digital age. So, and AI is of course in the center of these conversations among young people. So um, to add to that also, uh, I think from the survey or for the, from the poll, we learned that only three out of 10 young people feel like they have much control um, about their digital future. I think this last finding is very interesting because it kind of highlights that there is a sense of lack of trust at the moment within communities and uh, a lack of assurance that they can help shape, right, how this process is going, shape the outcome of their um, digital future, uh, shape the outcome of, um, and the process of AI. So. Young people have all this concern, and they're very much <laughs> rightly, uh, and very much rightly so, right? Um, if you look at the reality today, the prospect of our digital future, especially the future of AI, has not yet been the most inclusive, right? Uh, I mean, I think we could do so much better. We know, for instance, only 22% of AI professionals are women, and when we look into most of the panels on AI, um, clearly we, need, we can do better in terms of diversity, both in terms of age, geographical, um, race and age representation. I think this is actually one of the panels for us all women, so that's very exciting. <laughs> um, and very, I think that should also be the norm and not the exception, so uh, that itself. And I think if when you take a, even a, 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 a step before that and look at the, lar the larger picture of policy making process, both for AI policies, but also for many other policies that shape young people's life, young people are still very much missing from that decision making table. Um, I mentioned earlier that young people is the largest generation of the world. Nearly half of the world's population is actually under 30, but only less three, than 3% 3 of them uh, sit in the parliamentarians where decisions are actually be being made, right? So when we talk, uh, to your question, when we talk about community-driven responsible AI, 
We need to also address the need to make this process of shaping responsible AI very much open and accessible to communities, right, including young people. Um, I see that within um, this week, but also in many of these conversations that we're part of, multi-stakeholder approach is being embraced more and more, which is very exciting. I think it gives a lot of entry points for young people as part of the community to be part of this work and engage. Um, and a while back, we actually supported one of UNESCO's work in defining the building blocks uh, of having multi-stakeholder driven process for AI policymaking. And just to be mindful of time, um, I, I would really love to highlight like some of the building blocks that I thought was very interesting in the context of youth participation is that the first one is that the, in the context of developing AI policies, uh, it must be developed through an open and inclusive consultation process, right? And I think that's a given. Uh, I think most people agree with that. Um, but the second one, I think, is the most important one, is that we need to commit to incorporating what we hear back from the consultation, right? All the feedback, all the recommendations. Um, young people are often consulted in this process or often being asked to share what they, th their take on this, but we need to make sure that we're actually taking these recommendations into account and putting them in place. When we talk about multi-stakeholder approach, when we talk about community-driven AI, it needs to be not only open, but also meaningful. And so from a youth perspective, I think young people have already voiced out a lot uh, here, but also outside this wall, outside of IGF, that they want to be included and they're ready to be included. And we saw this in many of the recommendations that young people have developed uh, through different intergovernmental processes, but also even just now in the IGF, in the Youth Summit on Sunday. So, but they cannot achieve this by themselves and they shouldn't have to. We really need an intergenerational support to help achieve this. Uh, we need leaders, both in policy process, but also industry leaders uh, that could be allies to that could uh, start engaging young people as part of communities, uh, not only to be consulted, but also to be engaged as partners in shaping responsible AI. And I think only then when you engage peop uh, young people and other parts of community as partners and experts, you can have a community-driven process that is really meaningful. Thank you, Hillary. Um, you know, I appreciate the sort of learning opportunity that I get from everyone. And I think that, you know, it's, I really like your point about the need for engagement, of course, but then it also needs to be meaningful. And I think one of the key points that struck me the most was the, you know, the point you just made about the importance of representation, but that in reality, there's still so much to do. And, you know, when you look at communities and who are actually at the forefront of these efforts, it's just so inspiring to see them you know, doing a lot of the heavy work, but they just can't do it alone. But we're so lucky today to be joined by someone who is actually leading one of those community efforts for representation in the AI space, who is Kathleen Siminu. She's joining us online. Um, she is a writer, primarily of prose, but she has found herself detouring to write mostly code in her career. So she is a machine learning fellow at Mozilla Foundation, where she has been building speech recognition for Kiswahili. Kathleen, over to you. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, and thank you to the entire Chatham House team for having me and for accommodating this uh, virtual participation. I hope that you can hear me okay. Um, so I've been working on a project known as the Mozilla Common Voice Project and Briefly, by way of introduction, uh, Common Voice is a project to build open speech recognition data sets. It is a project that is important because a lot of data sets that do exist are proprietary, so they belong to organizations that are not opening them up. And many times we may find that the organizations have access to language data sets that they do not prioritize in terms of building products because these languages may not be a priority for them um, for various reasons. So this is the gap that Common Voice tries to bridge. Uh, in addition to it being a data set, I also like to tell that it is a platform that can and is used to build these open data sets. So we encourage communities to organize using the Common Voice platform. Um, they can mobilize um, 
community members to start building data for the languages that they care about. And one of the things that I really like about it is that the engineering and maintenance of the platform and the technology is taken care of by Mozilla. And this, this weight is then taken off of communities and they can focus on the building of, of the data set. There are over 150 languages available on Common Voice. And actually, in many instances, we find that the community is self-organized, completely independent of the Mozilla Foundation. But in the case of um, Kiswahili, it was a bit different. Uh, there is an African language program that is growing within Mozilla, and Kiswahili is one um, among several African languages that's received funding from um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, GIZ, which is a German development agency, and the UK development agency to build this particular data set. Um, similar work that preceded Kiswahili is for Kenya Rwanda, and similarly, we've had work uh, done to build data sets for Luganda, um, all languages in East Africa. So when it comes to community building, I'll briefly describe how the platform itself works and how we have gone about engaging the Kiswahili community in this case. Um, the essence of a speech recognition data set is that you have audio that is aligned with text. Uh, there's various ways that we can go about getting a data set of this specification. The way we do it on Common Voice is that uh, we first start by collecting text. Uh, this text is then segmented at sentence level, and then we upload them onto the platform. There's a validation step, of course, because we want to engage the community in creating the text, but then in also validating that this text is representative of their language. Once the text is on the platform, participants, community members, contributors can then come onto the platform and read the text out loud. And the platform then facilitates that you can record yourself reading the text. And this is how we arrive at a text and audio aligned data set. Um, in terms of community engagement, what this has looked at like is um, me and the wider team working on this, looking for opportunities to create this data with the community. Um, it has been a lot of partnership building uh, in terms of building the text, we've had uh, a partnership with a network of writers in Mombasa in Kenya, and uh, for it to be a similarly beneficial relationship to both us and them, what we do is run a quarterly writing competition. So the writers have a platform and incentive to create content, um, they send it in, they get the opportunity to win prize money, but then also um, have a panel of judges review their work and give feedback. And at the end of the day, all the contents that is created through this process gets uploaded onto the platform. Another relationship we have is with a university in Kilif in Kenya known as Pwan University. Um, and with them, we work with their language department, which has Kiswahili students. And they have, well, with the lecturers, we've worked to build a program, um, which is a semester long program where the students are taken through creative writing workshops. We invite external consultants who in their work work primarily with language. Um, in the past one has been a rapper, um, we've had a podcaster come on board and the idea is to give to the students in terms of gaining skill, but then also exposure to what their uh, expertise in language can mean in terms of professional opportunities. And then at the end of the day, they also write, yeah, they have writing workshops and essentially essay competitions as well. And again, this is content that gets onto the platform. Uh, we've organized similarly with Collecting Voice. Um, this has been um, events maybe at tech hubs. Tech hubs are very common here. We've had a network of what we call community champions. These are individuals within the community who have shown an affinity for wanting to work either on Kiswahili or particularly on the Common Voice project in collaboration with us. And what we have done is resource the community champions to then have events, whether it's at tech hubs, at their places of work, um, 
some have organized events at church, churches or church groups because these are the, the spaces where they um, have access to their communities. And so the data set has been built in this manner. Um, I'll try to rush through the rest of my points. In our work, we realized that um, actually learning from the rest of the world, we realized that with AI, there is a lot of opportunity for bias, uh, primarily gender bias. Um, and then somewhat secondary age bias, and this is specifically in speech recognition. So at the outset of our work, we were very intent to make sure that right from the beginning, we are being intentional about looking for and including these populations that are likely to be underrepresented. And then, you know, this results in a biased data set and biased models or um, end user products. So we've had a gender participation guideline that has guided our work and actually on Common Voice, Kiswahili is one of very few languages that has an almost equal balance between male and female contributors. And then we also do give individuals the opportunity to not share their demographic um, details. So it's about a third between male, female, and those who chose not to share. Um, in terms of opportunities for bias, we've also realized that there are things within our context that we need to consider. So with Kiswahili as a language, it's a, it's a big language, but then it does have related dialects and variants whose um, existence has sort of been pushed somewhat to exist extinction, but then maybe just to less use because of Kiswahili and its influence. So we wanted to make sure that the work that we do for this language can benefit some of the related dialects, which in the past have been negatively affected by Kiswahili. So we've worked with linguists and they have helped us develop subsets of the data set that are representative of these dialects. And at the end of the day, we're then able to evaluate our models to see how well they perform on these related dialects as well. And I'll hand over the mic back to Yasmin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen. I think the, the, the project that you're doing is fascinating. And if there's one thing that your efforts are showing is that, as what Hilary and Millie also mentioned, is that you just can't do it alone. Um, you need allies across the multi-stakeholder spectrum. And we're very lucky today to have Zoe joining the panel. Um, She's, from, so she's a senior manager on the consumer trust team at Google, where she focuses on building responsibility and trust in products for Google search, news, maps, and assistant. Previously, Zoe worked in Microsoft and Facebook, and prior to joining the tech industry, she served in various capacities within the UN and the US Department of Justice. Um, we're very lucky to have Zoe here today, so now, Zoe, over to you. Great, thank you so much. I have a couple of slides and I'm gonna take this in a slightly different direction and one that's very focused on product. I am on a product team and as Yasmin mentioned, uh, work on products like Google Search. So that's what I'll talk about. Um, so one of the issues for responsible AI lately really has to do with how do we build tools that are trustworthy? How do we build products that are trustworthy? And what does trustworthiness mean in the era of generated, uh, generative AI? So uh, today I'm gonna think about how we at Google are thinking through uh, these types of topics. And what I'm gonna do is kind of take us back to, uh, to the early days of the internet and um, at the risk of aging myself as a child of the 90s, can I just see a quick show of hands of who remembers any of um, these tips? Is it sharing at all? Hmm. I'm seeing a different slide. There we go. Who remembers any of these? Watch out for senders you don't know, check for grammar or spelling errors. Don't click on unexpected attachments. Yes, great. Uh, and so what are the types of tips that we're telling people today uh, now with uh, generative AI tools? Uh, we're seeing things like this. Watch out for wonky fingers and arms. Beware of overly smooth textures and uh, check for weird shadows. Uh, and People want shortcuts. They want easy heuristics to figure out whether something is trustworthy or not. 
And I get it, we're all really busy, but we can end up in some traps here. And so we have to think as a community how to build strong information literacy muscles. So let's just double click on one of these tips, uh, which is telling people to check for weird shadows. Uh, and using this as a trustworthiness check is actually really hard to do sometimes. So um, this is a very classic example. It's a famous photo of Lee Harvey Oswald, and he's ostensibly holding a rifle and communist newspapers in his backyard. Um, and, uh, and since this was released uh, and published in the press, Rumors have swirled about this photo and its authenticity. And the main argument is that this photo's been faked because there's no way these shadows could be, uh, could, could be real with one going down and one going on the side. And yet there have been many scientific and technical studies over the years uh, that have debunked this, but this conspiracy theory really just still persists. And so most recently, Hani Farid debunked this yet again. Uh, and he is a world famous expert in computer science and imagery. He's the father of photo DNA. He's not, in other words, your average user. And it actually took a lot of compute power to just check the shadows here. And we can't just do this for every image on the internet. So what we're learning is that these shortcuts are neither 100% reliable nor are they durable. So just like when we uh, told people to check for .org uh, in a URL, then spammers started buying up .org, uh, .org domains. And they also learned how to use spell check. And so in the future, AI is also going to be able to figure out hands, right? So these tips are not gonna work. So we need more resilient tools in the toolbox for the information ecosystem and everybody in it. Um, so I will just do a quick quiz and you can grade yourself just to see how good you are without any training at being a visual literacy expert. So uh, quiz number one, uh, which of these photos, you can just take a note for yourself, quiz number one, which of these has not been created with AI? Give you a minute. The next one is which photo is more or less as it's described? This one about seemingly about climate change on the left or this one about uh, also about climate change on the right and water levels? I'll give you a moment to guess whether it's A or B. And then lastly, which of these is a real product? Uh, either cheeseburger Oreo or spicy chicken wings Oreo. So please, again, grade yourself. It's actually the house on the left is a real place, whereas the house on the right is AI art. Um, uh, the, uh, the tweet here on the right is, uh, uh, is actually from a news photo. The tweet on the left is a, um, manipul it's a manipulated photo, not uh, through generative AI, but it was cropped to appear as two different uh, times when it's actually the same for same photo, same time. And then lastly, um, unfortunately, spicy chicken wing Oreos are real. So how many of you got 100% of these correct? Okay, so I'm not seeing anybody taking credit for that. Uh, and that's because, uh, uh, because we're actually pretty not great <laughs> at this. Uh, and so big thanks to Sabrina Caldwell at the Australian Natural, National University and her co-authors for inspiring this quiz. They did something very similar. They actually uh, had study participants and track their eye movements. And what they found is that people are not good at this. Their, uh, their accuracy rate is a little bit better than a coin toss. And moreover, they're not very good at identifying what's wrong in an image, what particular thing has been uh, manipulated or not. So um, we need better information literacy tactics as a community, uh, and those tactics need to evolve to prepare for more AI-generated content. But the question that is this AI is not the same as is this trustworthy? 
And we are seeing a lot of conflation of these two questions lately. Um, so here on the left, we have a non-AI generated image. It's supposed to be of trash uh, left by climate activists in Hyde Park. And so the claim here is that they're hypocrites because look at all the trash they leave around. But actually, it's from a 420 weed smoking celebration, which makes a lot more sense. And then here on the right, we have a photo that I prompted an image generator to create with the prompt Art of Hyde Park, London with Trash. So which one is trustworthy and which one is not? The context here really matters. And uh, mis and disinfo can happen with generated images. And they can happen with plain old vanilla taken out of context images. So sometimes real uh, maps onto trustworthy and sometimes it doesn't. So I'm going to go ahead and skip over uh, some slides just for the sake of time. And I'm going to go to one area that people ha have, it's been a really hot topic in the, in the area of, um, of responsible AI, and that's assertive provenance. And so what we mean by assertive provenance, we're talking about metadata, labels, meta tags, um, you know, marking, watermark saying, you know, this is generated by AI. Uh, now, I'm not going to talk about the technical feasibility of this. What I'm going to do is talk about possible user perceptions of labels. So recently at Google, we did a study with about 8,000 participants. Now they're US only. And we showed them an image with one of three labels. And we asked them questions about their interpretation of what this label meant, their confidence in the accuracy of the label, and how trustworthy they thought the label content seems to be. Um, and what we found was that comprehension really varied by label. And it was actually lowest for unlabeled content. And one thing I want to point out is that 14% of participants totally misinterpreted the meaning of a piece of content that had no label. The correct interpretation of no label means we don't know. We don't know if it's generated or not. But these participants thought that it meant that the image was not changed at all. And here we need to talk about uh, what some call the implied truth effect, which is a phenomenon where when some content is labeled as false, users infer that unlabeled content is true. And so we actually tested this. We presented respondents first with labeled content and asked them how trustworthy they thought that it seemed. Uh, some of them saw labeled content and then unlabeled uh, and then unlabeled content, and some saw unlabeled content, and then labeled content. And the TLDR here is that the presence of an AI label on some content seemed to make unlabeled content more trustworthy in the eyes of participants. But that's not what it means. It just means we don't know. So uh, what does this mean? It doesn't mean that labels are bad. It just means that we do need to approach all of these solutions, quote unquote, technical solutions to responsible AI very carefully. Otherwise, we could inadvertently increase user misperceptions or misinterpretations. Um, and I know that people really want easy answers, uh, but I think one thing we're seeing is we need many tools in the toolbox. Labels may be one of them. But nothing is a singular silver bullet. Uh, Misinfo is sticky, it moves fast, people have low attention spans, um, but at the same time we actually have to craft messages that appeal to all and will actually get read. So thank you so much. I'm going to pass it back and um, thanks for entertaining me while I talk about assertive provenance. Thank you, Zoe. No, now I really don't trust myself <laughs> anymore. Um, and you know, like you know that it's a good presentation when you you just change your perception on things. Um, so you know, I, I I think that we had a really brilliant set of presentations here, and um, you know, I and I think that not only do I learn about more, and I think that I realize how much I don't know about. Um, and you know, one of the key patterns that have emerged from this diverse set of presentations is, yeah, like how, how do you so, sort of, there's so much to do, but at the same time, how, how do you operationalize that? How do you make sure that we don't have any spicy chicken wing Oreo anymore? No, just kidding. <laughs> but no, how, how do we sort of, how do, how do we make sure that, you know, we, we are more trustworthy as humans, but in the context of AI, how do we make sure that the youth are more 
engage at the table? How do we make sure that data is equitable in, in, in the context of AI development? And so, you know, uh, before we move on to the, to, the, to the open discussions, I'd like to ask the panelists a quick fire round of questions. J you have 60 seconds to share with us, based on your experience in engaging with communities and or research, what will be your one recommendation to operationalize responsible AI in a way that is meaningful and impactful, again, based on your research and your respective areas of work? How can policy making in this space be relevant, whether it is to better engage with communities, whether it is to, make, to build the, sil the silver bullet to make us and technologies more trustworthy? Zoe, over to you. I think uh, from my presentation, the main point that I want to take away here is that there aren't these easy, quick solutions. Um, and what we really need to do is um, follow the research. So we did user research. We do user research, user research, user research all the time. That's kind of one thing that tech companies are pretty good at. Um, but I think in policy making or in uh, governance discussions, uh, sometimes we're thinking of things that feel intuitively right or feel intuitively good. And, um, and, and labels is, is one of them. And I do think labeling has to be part of the answer. Um, but I think that you have to think through, okay, academics are telling me, watch out for the implied truth effect. I'm gonna go uh, ask my UX team to study it. And then I'm going to act upon the findings, uh, whether it seems to support my original hypothesis or not. Um, so that is my personal recommendation, uh, which is like have a hypothesis and actually test it and be informed by uh, the best academic research and evidence-based practices. Thank so you are more of an experimentalist. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> Kathleen, what is your one, one quick fire sort of recommendation? I see a lot of data collection activities ongoing. And since data is the basis of AI, I would say to engage communities as you are collecting the data, educate them on what it means that they're giving that data, what the opportunities are, what can be built with this data, and then beyond that, to give them decision-making power. They should be able to decide what can and cannot be built or what should be built and what should not be built. I think that one of the key lessons that I've personally seen as valuable is from the health sector and what they call informed consent. I think that it's really interesting to see the importance of being informed, not just on substance, but also the choices and opportunities and risks that come with it. Um, Hilary, what would be your, um, your recommendation? Um, I think for the first part of my recommendation, it's also very much uh, aligned with Kathleen. Uh, it needs to be inclusive, right, and transparent, as I've said before. But I think the other part that is also important is that uh, it needs to be agile, so it can respond to evolving needs of the communities, right? So maybe this year it's labeling, maybe next year it's something else. Uh, I think it needs to have that agility as well. Thank you. Finally, Millie? Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with um, the other panelists. I think that we need to think about data governance as building trust over time. Um, so think about it as a relationship. You know, sometimes you'll make mistakes, but what counts is how you deal with the mistake. And sometimes ha having, having made a mistake can actually help make a relationship stronger because of how you work through it. So think about building trust over time, and that will include agility, responsiveness, inclusivity, but also recognizing that contexts change and needs will change over time. I, I would also just say on, on one, one thing slightly different is that I think the nature of that outcomes will also influence the stakes that are placed on that trust. And if we're in a digital economy where the winner takes all, where there's significant power asymmetry or significant incentives to kind of, you know, um, to have, have certain amount of control, then that will actually make that kind of mutuality and cooperation harder. And I think that the greater the power asymmetry, then the more likely it's going to become um, a race to the bottom. So I think e equity and not just inclusiveness. Thank you, Millie. Um, so now without further ado, we will be moving to the open discussions. 
So again, I am, it's, this is not a Q&A. I'm inviting you, everyone, for discussions. Of course, participants are wel very welcome to ask questions to the panel, and you know, it's brilliant. It's not always every day that we get such a brilliant uh, set of panelists, and I will ask them to intervene throughout the, our discussions. But we'd love to hear your thoughts, your experiences on community-centered models of governing AI technologies. What has worked in your, exp in your experience? What has worked less? What would you like us to learn from you? A few housekeeping notes again, for those in person willing to speak, raise your hand. For those on Zoom willing to intervene, use the chat or Q&A function. Um, and due to the limited time, please keep your intervention short um, if possible. But we would really welcome your thoughts. Um, and to kick us off, perhaps, one of the questions that we got already online, um, Rowan, would you like to read it? Because she's our online moderator as well. So we have one um, question that's come in from James. He says, um, how can AI and emerging technologies be harnessed to address pressing global challenges such as climate change and healthcare access whilst ensuring ethical and responsible development? Yeah, I'm happy to take that because uh, I think we have a couple of very clear examples here. So for climate change, for example, one of the things that's very important is building resilience for communities. So we're using predictive models uh, for both flood forecasting as well as wildfire detection. Uh, and actually using these models to tell people right on their phone, okay, expect a flood that's about knee high or about stomach high or about shoulder high. Um, and giving them a little bit earlier warning than they necessarily would have had, not only to save uh, lives, but also to save livelihoods. Um, and uh, on healthcare access, one of the things that we're using AI for is just to bridge the gap for how, uh, how there is a lack of centralized data on, uh, on, on, on healthcare, for example. So in the US, there's no centralized database, for example, about whether a certain provider accepts this insurance or that insurance. And so what we're doing is using uh, an AI tool called Duplex to call up healthcare providers to say, uh, do you accept Blue Cross Blue Shield? Do you accept Aetna? Blah, 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 blah. And uh, we're putting that now right directly into search and maps. Uh, so, and it also Medicare and Medicaid. So people are getting more accessible information at their fingertips with, while they're not having to do as much work on their own. Um, and also relieving some of the burden on healthcare providers as well, who used to be getting call after call after call, do you accept my insurance? So those are just a couple of examples, um, but I think there are the, the opportunities are really limitless here. I haven't even mentioned generative AI and, and the way that that could help with protein mapping and, um, and also possibly personalized medicine. But I am not an expert in that, but those are two examples. Hillary? Given your work on climate change, do you want to do you want to come in on this one at all? Yeah, maybe just very briefly, right? I think um, I was actually just in a panel before this one, and we talk a lot about how do we flip the narrative of seeing technologies and online or digital platforms uh, instead of them being a, a source of harm and risk, but uh, more of a source of opportunities. Actually, I think there have been a lot of youth-led uh, solutions specifically that caters or that tries to use AI um, to bring good in like global challenges like um, identifying actions for climate. Um, uh, more a few weeks ago in New York in the SDG Summit, actually one of the youth-led initiatives, um, there was a platform that was created by uh, young people to actually, uh, similar to what uh, was mentioned by Zoe, to uh, provide an early warning system uh, on uh, fire, especially um, in uh, places in the uh, in the world where they have uh, heat waves are more frequent and getting more frequent, uh, especially in the global south, um, there's not a lot. They were using, I think, I believe, uh, data from NASA on this to build a youth-friendly um, uh, app that allows young people to receive this um, uh, this uh, early warning systems and sorry, early early warning notifications. And then on top of that. 
Uh, the other exciting thing, and, and this I think is just one of the ma many, many wonderful examples of Vila Solutions, they're also engaging young people to see how young people can help contribute in um, mapping out data in their communities on um, both deforestation and frustration efforts. So I think if we are also willing to look into uh, a lot of grassroots solutions, community-driven solutions, there are many ways how uh, young innovators have been using this to uh, mitigate or uh, help um, find solutions that could help adapt to a crisis like climate. Thank you, Hilary. Now, I think that one of the things that struck me from what you just said is the, oh, the importance of ownership in building these solutions, because I think that, you know, AI has a lot of potential to build, to, to address global challenges, but at the same time, if we want it to be inclusive, it also needs to have a certain level of ownership from the communities. And I think that, Kathleen, um, you're, the, you're, you're really good placed to talk to us about ownership through your experience. Can you tell, can you tell a few words about that? Well, I think ownership is, is interesting, um, especially ownership of data in this case. Um, it's, a, it's a great question because I think that many times the communities that are building the data or the communities that the data is about will not have the skills or the resources to participate in the building of AI tools, right? Um, but then the nature of the AI ecosystem is such that when I take a data set and I build an AI tool, first the transformation is massive, but it's also really difficult to assign back value, right? So it's difficult for communities to maintain ownership because um, I can take the data set, I can use it without their knowledge potentially, um, but then also there's no strong motivation for me to give back to the communities. And maybe I'll, I'll also piggyback on a question I've seen online from Alex. He, he asks, does community AI need open source or are they different? So where open source is concerned, I think because we're working with software, I can take a software, incorporate it into something I'm building, and then now I'm relying on this original software. And therefore I can donate back or I can give back by contributing to the code base to make it better. But there's incentive to make it better always. Um, it's very different with data and the process of transforming it into a software or an AI tool. I don't see the strong pull to come back to the community that the data, that owns the data to, to give back or to contribute back to them in the same way, because there's no coupling between the AI software that is built out of it versus, um, yeah, there's no coupling between the AI software and the data. I feel like I'm rambling, but I think ownership is a great question. I, I don't think we have cracked enough yet how ownership can be maintained in communities, especially if they don't have the skills themselves to, to build the AI tools. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, and I think that, you know, it's the question of incentives is something that I, I'm trying to think about on a daily basis. What incentivizes people? And it's such an important question for when it comes to data governance, but also in terms of community engagement. And that sort of helps us segue into the second question that was asked by the fellow participants online on the importance of, you know, with the importance of data in the digital age. How can data governance frameworks be designed to balance the need for innovation with the imperative of safeguarding individual privacy and maintaining public trust? How do you sort of incentivize communities to engage to build data solutions in a way that where they would be, you know, sort of reassured that their rights will be safe, uh, safeguarded and that they, 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 they I mean, those who build the solutions can gain the trust of communities. Millie, do you have some thoughts about that? Um, yeah, just just on that, I, I guess I would say that, look, um, ethical innovation is sustainable innovation, right? Because if you, if you develop something and it's developed in an ethical way and the impacts are experienced by people as ethical and fair, then they will carry on using it and it will be integrated into society and economy. Whereas if you in innovate, develop something that's not seen as ethical and that's not experienced as ethical, um, then either it will just stop being 
used and you've wasted your time and your capital, or if it is used, it'll be used with mistrust and resentment and so on, and that will reduce your ability to manoeuvre and introduce something else. So I think it's seeing those kind of considerations for privacy, for sustainability, for, you know, kind of like equity and so on, inclusiveness, actually seeing them as good innovation, not just good in the ethical sense, but it's just good business sense, right? And I think that that's definitely something with GDPR when it came in. And um, I know certainly in the UK, um, the Information Commissioner's Office, they were really keen to stress, look, privacy isn't just kind of like compatible with innovation. It's necessary for innovation. Otherwise, what you're making is not going to fly. So I, I'll just kind of counter, counter that dilemma a bit. But just to come back to that, the first question from James, if I may, I was just thinking as I was hearing the discussion. Um, in terms of AI being useful for health and for climate change and so on, um, sorry, I remembered the image on your slide deck about the silver bullet. There's no silver bullet. I think also... Just because this technology is really exciting and can do lots of really interesting things, it doesn't mean it's a solution for everything. And I think it's really important to diagnose the problem and then understand what the right kind of tool is. Because if we buy into this idea that AI can do anything, AI is going to kind of you know, change all our lives for the better, whatever, you're, you're not taking a critical perspective on what AI is, what it's good for, what it's not so good for, what kinds of solutions are long-term sustainable solutions versus what kind of solutions are just band-aids and temporary fixes that are going to leave the underlying issues, the underlying policy questions, the underlying issues of inequality and so on, and existential risk to communities from climate change or lack of public health access. I don't think... There isn't evidence yet that AI can address those. And the danger is that we use AI as a band-aid to cover those deeper problems, to avoid dealing with those deeper issues. And I think just this community-led approach is going to be really important for having those community questions about what are we going to do about climate change, what are we going to do about health inequalities, and so on. Sorry. Thank you, Millie. And you know what, what we just mentioned, it, it's... It reminds me of the concept of wicked problems. It's those problems that are related to, like, first of all, you can't even agree on what the problem is. And then it feels like when you think of a solution, another problem came, comes up. Um, may, may I just respond to that? Exactly. Yeah. So wicked problems, are they're never completely solved. But what you can do is ameliorate them by building trust across communities. So once you commit to the process of this community-led approach, you can, you're resilient to deal with the imperfections, you know? And I think that... I'm, I, it's because I love AI, because I think the technology is fantastic and brilliant, that I don't want it to be misunderstood, put on a pedestal, and then it falls off the pedestal, everyone's really upset. It's precisely because I think it's such a great technology that I don't want it to be overhyped and oversolved, and we need to kind of be realistic about what it is and isn't. Zoe, you're from Google. Do you think that AI is overhyped, or is it not? <laughs> I mean, I would actually question the premise of the question because it's very hard to think about AI as one singular monolithic thing. So when you're talking about data privacy, for example, what Millie was discussing, uh, the salient human rights uh, and the calculus is different if you're talking about a robot vacuum than if you're talking about, um, you know, facial recognition software, right? Both AI. Uh, and so I think it's important to um, think through uh, what are the systemic risks, what are the risk mitigations that you can put in place for various different types of AI use cases. And I really liked the conversation that um, Kent and others were having earlier in uh, uh, on the main stage at IGF about what even is the good definition of AI, you know, should we be using something like a phrase like computational statistics? Because th the idea of AI itself can become a little bit um, reified and obscure and stand for everything and nothing. And so I think we do kind of have to think through it use case by use case. Thank you. Um, I think that it's really important to think first, what is AI, <laughs> you know? And one of the sort of components of it that a lot of people are talking about is open source AI. And I think that Alex um, submitted a question online on does community AI need open source AI? And I think that's something that we briefly touched upon um, through Kathleen, but I was wondering if Hilary, Millie, or Zoe, do you have any thoughts on the value of open source AI with, with regards to community? Do communities need open source AI? 
I mean, I do, uh, but I was just speaking, so I don't want to take time away from other panelists. Um, I think just like AI generated does not necessarily map on to trustworthy. I don't think open source always necessarily maps on to good, best, right. Um, and so Google has long supported the open source community. It's been part of our ethos. Um, I think there are like very important questions about, uh, especially around safety and responsibility for open source models. Um, as it becomes easier and easier to uh, fine tune models with less compute power, uh, if anybody with a computer can do it, some people can tune something to be more hate speechy, for example, or maybe a little bit more biased. Um, and so I do strongly believe in uh, the open source movement. I also think just as you need responsible AI in, uh, AI in development in the traditional sense, whether that's being t uh, carried out by, by tech companies or industry, we need a conversation about responsible AI um, in the age of um, open source large language models as well. Yeah, I'm happy to, I guess, build on that. I think, again, just working a lot with young people, um, many young people I think have really benefit from um, open source AI in a sense that, um, in a sense that it makes uh, AI more uh, closer to their ownership, right? But I think the question that we also need to keep in mind is that uh, exactly what was just said by now is that how do we build capacities um, of young innovators who can leverage open source AI so that um, they would have the capacity to build tools and solutions based on AI that are safe, that are rights respecting, uh, that are effective, right? So I think making open source available is one thing, being able to also support all the other building blocks that follows it, um, such as you know, uh, capacity building, providing um, really quality education on that subject as well, especially for uh, young innovators or younger innovators, I think that's also something that we really need to think about as well. Thank you, Hilary. Um, this sort of got me thinking, the theme, the title of this session is revi Revisiting the Social Contract. And one question I had in mind for the panelists here is how does AI affect the social contract? You know, we, we're talking about, for example, capacity building and awareness and transparency and openness um, and equ equity. But in the end, it's also a lot a question of those who hold power and those who are subject to power. And so there is this sort of underlying assumption with the social contract that those who hold the power will at least Con cons um, conserve and safeguard the rights of those who are subject to power. How do you think that AI is affecting the social contract and how does it affect the social contract with regards to the communities that you engage with? Sorry, this is a really difficult question. I think we can write a PhD about that. <laughs> um, Kathleen, do you want to go first? <laughs> Not really, but I will. <laughs> um, I think that it's it's very difficult for the social contract to be upheld or to be maintained if those in power are not giving power, giving an ear to those who don't have the power. Um, so if the status quo is that those who already have are the ones who continue to build and we expect that they will consider the perspective of the underrepresented, um, I think the opportunity for change or doing anything different or maintaining the social contract is very different. Um, it's very difficult. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't so much like this idea of a social con construct. It seems very centralized. Um, I would opt for a more decentralized um, state of affairs where everybody has power to some extent in, in their local context and they can then define what is right and good for that social context. Um, and I think this is in line with just putting more power in the hands of the communities and letting them maintain whatever social contract 
is is needed in that context. Thank you. And I think yeah, the question of revisiting the notion of social contract and the status quo is so important. And we talk often about AI being revolutionary and disruptive and everything, but you know, is it really disruptive? I know that, Millie, you are working on a piece right now on the revolutionary potential of AI. What do you think about that? How, is it really revolutionary for communities? Um, I, I, I was thinking about the question, like, um, you know, AI and the social contract, and I think that um, maybe, maybe there aren't yet enough use cases for us to be sure. So I, I can see a way to begin to answer the question um, about the internet and the social contract. Um, and I can see a way to think about the last industrial revolution um, that we had that began in, in Europe that time. So thinking about um, the impact of the internet and digital economies and the social contract, I think if you think about um, vertical relationships between individuals and the government, I think that um, it's really important that the digital economy um, is seen as equitable and inclusive. Otherwise, if, if people aren't benefiting or don't see themselves benefiting from the digital economy, then I think the resentment towards government for either introducing it or allowing it to kind of, you know, become, become part of economy and society, I think that will affect that vertical power relation. But then thinking about the horizontal relationships peer to peer, I think one thing that um, digital economies have allowed us to do is find each other, you know, and if you're from a minority community um, or from an intersectional group, being able to find other people like you um, is really important for solidarity, for empowerment, and even just kind of like um, sh sharing knowledge and building up a kind of, you know, a, 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 a community of language, of culture, of, you know, um, tacit knowledge and so on. So thinking about how that, that affects affects the social contract, the horizontal opportunities and the vertical risks. Don't yet know about AI. I think I would just say that the last industrial revolution um, that, that began in Europe, um, yes, it brought around you know, huge um, economic opportunities. It was also the beginning of climate change. It was also the beginning of disability um, discrimination. It also created categories of disability. Um, and I think that it's, you know, um, we need to be aware of that. And if we're going to build an economy based on AI or where AI has a really key role and call it the fourth industrial revolution, then we need to think about, well, who's it going to exclude? Which categories of people are going to find themselves experiencing new kinds of prejudice and what kind of um, impacts on the world is this going to have that weren't there before? Um, so just to bring in a question that we've had online. So we're talking a lot about power and power is also inevitably about money as well. Um, so we have a question about AI training and they're asking, um, does AI access paid resources um, and research ideas, articles, etc.? And if it doesn't, um, do we have any comments on that? Is that something that you think that should be changed to make it more accessible and make it more um, effective as well? Um, Zoe, I was wondering if you want to come in on this. Um, I mean, I don't think we can necessarily use AI to circumvent copyright laws, for example. <laughs> and uh, we have to respect rights holders, of course. Uh, I think the most practical way I can answer this question is that from a very technical level, uh, uh, site owners, publishers can set their uh, sites to be crawled or not crawled. Uh, and they use robots.txt, and, they, and they've used that for a few decades now. Um, so there is not a technical solution that I think we would <laughs> employ to say, oh, a paywalled piece of content, let me get around it with my crawler and, and crawl it and use it to open up information. I think what we're thinking through is how can we incentivize overall, and maybe this gets back to your question about the social contract, but how can we incentivize content creation on the open web? Um, and how can everyone benefit from that? Uh, I think that's probably the most interesting question about um, the health of the information ecosystem, the health of the web as, you know, I kind of grew up with it where every one of us nerds back in the day had an Angel Fire site or a Lyco site or, you know, I certainly had my X-Files fan page, which I always talk about. 
Um, and that type of content creation just isn't happening anymore to the same extent. Uh, you know, we all, I had a blog. Who, Millie, did you have a blog? You look like you might have had a blog. Okay, <laughs> Mill, Millie had an angel fire. So, um, you know, I, I would love to capture some of the spirit of that age of the internet, and now that might be showing that I'm like about, I'm entering my middle age and getting wistful for, um, for, for you know, days gone by. Um, but I think that's where I would focus some of my energies. How can we change some of the incentives to make sure that um, that people are um, creating, sharing, consuming content in 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 a, in a more open environment? Zoe, you're bringing me lots of PTSD with my teenager blogs. Like, <laughs> I'm not sure I want anyone to see that blog. But anyway, um, you know. It, it, Question of incentive, uh, in incentives, again, like, it's so important. And Hillary, as a youth, as you know, engaging with the youth, I'm sure that you have lots of thoughts on what has worked and what has not worked. In the context of incentivizing the youth? To engage in the first place. Because you know, we heard from Kathleen that in her experience, when it comes to collecting data for training and the, 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 her models, the problem is that the communities that are supposed to, I mean, that are targeted to help build those databases don't see why they should do it in the first place. How, how, how have you dealt, I mean, have you ever faced this issue? And if yes, like what has worked? Yes, I mean, maybe perhaps sharing a little bit of a different experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I mean, again, right, as I mentioned earlier uh, at the start of this panel, uh, Fortunately, I guess, um, the community that I work with, the community of young people, are actually, uh, you know, a generation of digital natives. So <laughs> I think uh, we don't actually prompting them. A lot of time, they're actually just sign up to be involved and engage, right? And, and you see this not only in tech. I, I think we talk a lot about climate crisis just now or climate change. Um, uh, no one was actually tasking young know, people to march up and advocate for their rights, their rights to climate um, climate justice. Um, no one is particularly tasking young people to create solutions on uh, to create a, a you know a more better digital future. But young people do it anyway, right? Um, I'm sure you felt that. Many of us <laughs> have felt that as well. And I think. Of course, there's many reasons behind this, but again, it's mostly also because we are part of that generation that will really feel the impact of all of this, right? So not just two, three years from now, but 50 years from now, 10 years from now, uh, 50 years from now, 100 years from now. I think, um, uh, like, I, again, right, as a young person who lives in this uh, age of time, um, for me, and I think if I can also speak on behalf of many other young people as well, um, if I don't engage, if I don't take part of being the solutions, even though the room uh, might not be open for me, um, I would be afraid of not doing enough to change the discourse of my future, right? So I think when it comes to incentivizing the youth, uh, I think they're they're already very much there and motivated and then putting themselves out there. But the question is that how do we incentivize partners across generations, across uh, stak uh, stakeholders to actually, wa uh, to actually um, work together with you who already sign up for this, who already show up even when the world is not um, uh, opening doors for them, right? So I think it's a slightly different experience, um, but I would have to say that it also takes a, a lot of privilege, right, to show up, to, to, um, uh, to, to be a part of, uh, uh, of the solutions. Many young people, as you know, like they're in school, they just graduated, some of them are still in school. Uh, many of them are also uh, still adolescents. So I think um, uh, if we're serious in incentivizing youth, we also have to look into what, uh, are the enabling environment that's needed to help them to effectively contribute to this, right? Um, it's, again, uh, a privilege to be able to um, advocate for transparent, um, transparent AI process in a country where um, your rights is valued, your rights is protected. It might not be the case in many countries. And I think 
um, when it comes to again incentivizing youth, you look in, you need to look into all that other external factors as, uh, as well, not just um, incentivizing them from a motivation pers perspective, but actually uh, building a, a, a safe and enabling environment for them to be able to participate. So. Thank you. I think that um, enabling an environment, like an enabling environment for effective and meaningful contribution, I think that is really beautifully put. And this reminds me of a project that Rowan is helping to conduct on recursive public that she mentioned earlier um, in her introduction. Rowan, I wonder if you can say a few words about it. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, we're conducting a uh, project uh, with OpenAI MV Taiwan, which is looking at um, using uh, AI tools such as Polis um, to enhance um, the democratic process. And we're looking at AI policy in particular. So um, we have reached out to hundreds of different people um, from many different sectors um, to gauge their opinions on different statements around AI to tr help it try and inform policy um, and open AI's um, policy on AI. Um, so yeah, that's... <laughs> I like how it's AI helping to shape AI policy <laughs> as well. Um, you know, when, when we think about the effectiveness and meaningfulness of contribution of communities such as the youth and everything, we often think about, as you said, those who want to contribute, but at the same time those in power who are able to help implement the solutions. And one of those who are in power, obviously, the government, but then the other sort of entity that is there is the private sector. Zoe, I wonder if you can sort of share a few words on how Google helps to engage with those communities and sort of take forward recommendations and work on you know, making sure that AI is indeed developed in a responsible way. Um, I mean, I think it goes, I think the most important thing to mention here is that we have an established process for rolling out and testing changes. So um, it's not necessarily that any engineer, we have thousands of engineers, <laughs> that any engineer has a good idea and we just roll it out and push it into prod. Uh, there are different ways that we test to see whether things are actually better for users. And one of the ways that we do this is using search quality raters. Uh, and I actually think using r search quality raters is a good proxy for communities because they are supposed to represent average people. They're not content moderators, they're not fact checkers. They help us understand if our uh, changes are actually better for the people who are meant to be using our products. Um, and so uh, launches go through a rigorous battery of tests. Some are automated and some include uh, human rating, and no one within Google, um, not even Sundar, can change the results of those evaluations, and we use those to understand whether we should actually launch uh, a change or not. Um, so, so that's one way, uh, mm -hmm. and that's a long-standing practice at Google. And how can you become a search quality rater? Because you said that it's a way, of, it's, a, it's a sort of proxy way of engaging communities. If anyone here is keen on becoming a search quality rater, how do they do that? We do recruit. Um, we do recruit uh, through uh, through contracting services, and it depends on um, where we need rating at any given moment or time. So people can become raters. My <laughs> colleague Jeff, who's actually now. Uh, uh, um, on our search uh, public policy team, he actually, back in the day, just graduated from graduate school uh, and uh, decided to become a search quality rater as kind of a temporary gig in between jobs. So, um, so it depends. I, I don't know exactly every single country where we're, where, um, where we're looking for raters, but um, uh, I can certainly share more information about the program uh, to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Zoe. So as we're wrapping up, um, just to remind everyone that this is a learning um, opportunity, and I wanted to ask our panelists 
in 60 seconds to summarize one thing that they have learned today. Um, Millie, you're the first. Um, thank you. Well, a surprising takeaway for me from the session is thinking about um, the different meanings of community. You know, community can be local, it can be geographic, but it can also be transnational, it can be a generation, as in, you know, what Hillary works with, or it could be a community of interest, um, you know, for example, what, what um, Kath Kathleen works with. So just thinking about the different definitions of community, um, and then that also means that every one of us is a member of more than one community. So I think thinking about community led frameworks, um, thinking about making them adaptable and resilient is just going to have to be the way forward because I think we're all a lot more conscious of what it means to be part of different communities and these communities are no longer as rigid and kind of bound in time and space as, as they used to be before the internet. Thank you, that's really beautifully put. Hilary, what is your one surprising takeaway today? Well, it's not surprising, but I think the one key takeaway is that um, there is a huge appetite, it seems, from different partners from across stakeholders to work together to build a responsible AI, which I'm excited to see how that will look like in the next couple of years as well. Uh, but I think the other key takeaway um, that I, wa I thought uh, when I he I'm hearing all the panels is like how this work is, and I think going is still going to be very much ever evolving. And then in this process, it's important that uh, every step of that uh, evolvement or um, evolution, um, there we need to make sure that community is engaged, right? A diverse set of community, inclusive community. So that's my one key takeaway. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, the thing that resonated with me most is something that um, one of the other panelists said about thinking of the collective in this age of AI as opposed to individuals. So collective rights, collective harms, collective benefits, and then I will add collective power. Thank you. And finally, Zoe. Uh, well, one like very tangible thing is I learned more about the Chatham House project about uh, AI governance. I'm, I'm quite interested in that. Um, my, Dear friend Aviv Avadia has been writing a lot about this, uh, and I've been kind of thinking through, well, what would that actually look like in practice? So kind of excited to see how you're going to bring that, uh, bring that to life. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to thank all the panelists here today for joining us either in person or online, and also the participants for their brilliant questions. Um, to repeat, we'll up be uploading a meeting summary and the key takeaways on the IGF's website, Allah, and you can find the recording of the session on YouTube. Um, and yeah, um, and you know, if you want to engage more on our work, whether it's the brilliant work that each of the panelists is doing or Chatham House's work, please feel free to contact us um, in person or by email. Thank you very much. <laughs>